This is Congressman Peter Welch. I want to welcome you to a telephone town hall meeting uh, where we're going to discuss the future of the war in Afghanistan and America's anti-terrorism policy. By the way, if anyone has a question or a comment that you'd like to uh, share, press star three. Press star three at any time during this call, and you'll be connected to a member of my staff who will take your name and the town you're calling from, and then we'll make your comment live. Uh, this discussion could not have come at a better time. Uh, the killing of uh, Osama bin Laden, bringing him to justice earlier this month by a targeted special forces raid in Pakistan, has allowed members to ask questions about the future of the war in Afghanistan and our current anti-terrorism policy. Many in Congress are asking the question, is the current strategy in Afghanistan effective in combating the threat of terrorism, and is it financially sustain uh, sustainable when our country is facing such incredible fiscal challenges? Just last week, the House considered two measures, uh, which I co-sponsored, that would have required a withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Well, the measures didn't pass. The results show that there is growing opposition to the war in Congress. One measure gathered the support of 204 members of Congress, only 12 sh votes short of passage, uh, and another got 128 votes uh, where it was a, 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 a sharper uh, bill. That's why I'm holding this town hall meeting tonight, to hear your ideas. Now, again, just to, for those folks just getting on, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, hit star three. Now, this is a very special evening, uh, because, and I want to uh, say why. Joining me on tonight's call uh, is Congressman Jason Chaffetz. He's a Republican from Utah's 3rd Congressional District. Congressman Chaffetz has been a leader on the question of re-examining our policy of nation building in Afghanistan. Uh, he and I worked together to co-sponsor uh, these amendments. Uh, he has been a vigorous, clear, and articulate spokesperson. Uh, and I admire the work that he's done, and I believe that by the two of us working together, uh, a Republican conservative and a Democrat from uh, Vermont, it's giving us a boost in strengthening our position that it's time to reexamine our policy. So I'd like to thank Congressman Chaffetz for joining me in this bipartisan town hall meeting, and I'd like to turn it over to him. Well, thanks. Uh, again, this is Jason Chaffetz. Uh, I'm a Republican, a conservative from, from Utah. Uh, but I, I'm proud to, and glad to be on this call. Uh, Peter Welch is uh, one of the more agreeable pe people uh, to get along with, uh, and it's, uh, I think what the American people want is people on both sides of the aisle to come together, particularly on an issue as, as important as in Af Afghanistan. Now, I just believe after 10 years that it's time to bring our troops home. Uh, we still are going to be involved in counterterrorism operations around the globe. Um, we're going to need the very best intelligence uh, along the way. But in this particular instance, I think after 10 years of war, it warrants us bringing our troops home. And that's not something we should ever be bashful about saying. We should be proud of the fact that our goal is to bring the men and women who are serving uh, everywhere from Vermont to Utah to California to Florida, all across, all across the globe, to pat them on the back, to thank them, particularly coming off this Memorial Day holiday, thank the men and women who have been serving this country so valiantly but that it's time for the president to bring them home. And hopefully uh, with support in Congress, uh, we can achieve that goal. And just uh, for your information, the amendments that uh, uh, Congressman Chaffetz and I sponsored basically said this, that after 10 years of nation building, uh, spending over $100 billion a year, uh, supporting 100,000 troops and 100,000 contractors, uh, the question is, is that sustainable uh, financially and militarily? And does it make sense to do that when there's only, according to General Petraeus, fewer than 100 al-Qaeda in Afghanistan? Or is it time to ask the question, would American national security be better served? And would it be more financially sustainable if we moved away from nation building, expensive and unending, and moved towards counterterrorism? And of course, counterterrorism is what was successful in getting Osama bin Laden. It was based on comprehensive and coordinated and shared intelligence and a very, the very best special forces operation. And I think uh, Congressman Chaffetz and I think that where you have a threat of terrorism, which is real, but it's dispersed and decentralized, not focused in a nation state, then our response should be dispersed and decentralized 
not a nation building operation where we couldn't possibly send an occupation army in every country in the world where some terrorists can be located. So we're going to turn it over, hit star three, uh, if you have any questions. And I guess our first question is coming from Edward in Burlington. Uh, and Edward, go ahead. Uh, yes, I guess I'm a little concerned if there's a unilateral pullout. It kind of sends a message that uh, we really don't have staying power. Um, we, we've done that in, in, in the past, and it's always sent a message to our enemies that if they wait long enough, we'll lose our resolve and, and just pull out. I'm not saying we should maintain the current level of troops and stay there forever, but I think there should be a very gradual, um, mm -hmm. organized, uh, goal-setting type of a pullout. That I'm, I'm just concerned about a, a, with us leaving, a vacuum being in there, and then they all start congregating again in Afghanistan. We've got to go back in again. So that, that, that's why I would prefer the method that I recommend. Okay. Well, Edward, uh, thanks for your call. This is uh, Congressman Jason Chaffetz. Uh, I think a lot of us have that concern. If you look at the bill, well, for instance, one of the amendments that, uh, that Peter and I offered together, uh, it said that the president needed 60 days to come up with a plan in order to have a very timely withdrawal. It also recognized that we'll probably have some sort of presence there on an ongoing basis to take care of the counterterrorism uh, needs of the United States of America. My admission has been that, look, when there is a clear and present danger to the United States of America, of course we want our president to act. But in, in, in Afghanistan, it is a terribly sad and difficult situation. You've got a country where more than 80% of the people are illiterate. They have no more than uh, a second-grade education. Uh, you have an infrastructure that has been decimated through 30 years of war, first with the Russians and, and many of the efforts that we've been involved. We've actually been involved in trying to build up and build back many of that infrastructure that, that has been decimated over the course of time. But you're right. When there's a, there's a vacuum left, you worry about the people who have put their trust in America to help them create some safety and security. Now, at the same time, we also need to make sure that there's a, a rule of law, that there's a justice system that, that is in place. But if we try to do all things for all people in every situation and try to, to pull them up, we're going to be there for, their, for the next 50 years. And I think first and foremost, at least from my point of view, the biggest, the most deepest um, uh, obligation we have are to the men and women that are serving and to the protection, safety, and security of the United States of America. And I think we can still do both without spending more than $100 billion, because that's what it costs in a 12-month basis to operate in Afghanistan. At the same time, make sure that we don't allow a safe haven for terrorism to be recreated there in Afghanistan. Yeah, and it, Ever, you, you make a good point, uh, and I think the policy that we pursue is one that we have to manage. And whether, as it was in Iraq, when there was a question of, should we send in more troops, then we're asking the military to manage an escalation. Then when the president made the decision to start bringing our troops home, he asked the military uh, to manage a, a withdrawal. And in both cases, you've got to do it in a prudent way. You've got to give some flexibility to our battlefield commander. Uh, and I think what Congressman Chaffetz and I are saying is that let's say we're changing the policy away from nation building and move towards bringing our troops home, but we've got to manage that carefully. So, uh, you know, it's great to have Congressman Chaffetz here with me, and, and uh, thank you for your good question. Our next question comes from Robert in South Burlington. Robert, uh, you're on the air for Congressman Chaffetz and uh, me. Thank you. Uh, my two-part two question. One, what is the administration's position and how are they responding to the request to get out of there? I think you should arm the citizens and let them fight their own battles. And two, what's the position of the Congress on uh, stopping the president from bombing Libya if he hasn't got approval on according to the 60-day uh, requirement that he, Congress declare war in Libya? Well, the first question, uh, you know, Jason's uh, suggesting I go, I go first. Uh, the president hasn't responded to the vote uh, or our letter, but what we all know is that there's a very vigorous debate internally within the administration, and it involves uh, our highest officials in the intelligence community, the military community, and the political community about reexamining nation-building versus counterterrorism. 
And if you remember, there were lots of reports around the time the president made that decision to send 30,000 more troops in. And uh, 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 Vice President Biden was associated with the counterterrorism argument, and uh, others were on the other side. And I think what we see is the benefit of this vote for the president is that he has a clear signal from Congress that we would be supportive of a much more rapid drawdown of troops and a much more rapid uh, departure from nation building and embrace of counterterrorism. Uh, on Libya, my view that the president should pursue the War Powers Act, and there's not a quick and easy answer to to change that. Congressman Chaffetz, Jason? I, I um, look. I I want um, nothing more than for the Afghan people to live in a safe and secure situation. Um, at the same time, I think our, our most important objective here is to secure. The United States of America. Now, I haven't talked to Peter Welch about this, but one thing that I would actually like to see the president do is um, issue an, another intelligence estimate. You know, back in 2009, there was a national intelligence estimate where the intelligence services put together a report for Congress. That was really the genesis of a lot of my thinking about what to do next. We got to remember, back in 2009, According to the National Intelligence Estimate, there were less than, less than 100 al-Qaeda in the entire country. This is a country that is a roughly 30 million people, uh, roughly the size of California, and they estimated there were less than 100 al-Qaeda. Now, since then, Leon Panetta, the CIA director, said there were less than 50 and no known terrorist camps. The second part of that is they said that the Taliban posed no clear and present danger to the United States of America, nor did they pose a clear and present danger to the current Afghan government. And if that's all true, and that was 2009, then it begs the question of what are we doing spending $100 billion with 100,000 plus people in that country? And so that's what I think that I, one of the things that I would encourage the president to embrace is to publish another one of these reports so that Congress can review that. I think that would help with a lot of people's thinking. As far as Libya, uh, personally, uh, I just don't believe that the president um, should be engaging in what is, I consider, a civil war in North Africa. The bottom line for me is, if there is not a clear and present danger to the United States of America, I do not believe we should be engaging our forces to the degree that we have in Libya. I just, I disagree with the president on this one. I consider myself actually quite hawkish. Um, well, I just believe that if you're going to use your military, you use them what they're intended for, you go with everything you've got, you get the job done, and then you come home. It's this nation building that Peter Welch and I think of uh, find unpalatable given our, our fiscal situation, but also the fact that we are literally, we've lost thousands and thousands of our, of our neighbors and friends in this fight, and, it, and it's time to start bringing them home. Uh, for those of you who just joined the call, uh, I'm here with uh, Congressman Jason Chaffetz, and we're talking about Afghanistan. And if you'd like to ask a question or you'd like to make a comment, hit star three. Uh, anybody who uh, wants to get in the queue, star three, and you'll be uh, put on the air live. Uh, we had a question uh, just a while ago from Carol in Manchester. Uh, she hung up, but her question was, uh, if we leave, won't the Taliban become a threat? And I'll make a few comments on that, then Jason ask you to. Uh, Al-Qaeda was our threat. Uh, the Taliban was a real problem for us. I mean, they're terrible people, and what the things they believe are not what we believe. Uh, we all understand that. Uh, but the threat to America was al-Qaeda in the safe haven that was provided by the Taliban. So the counterterrorism approach that we believe can, uh, can be effective to protect us uh, will address that. Secondly, uh, I think it does make sense uh, to try to negotiate uh, the, the safe situation in, in, in Afghanistan where we avoid getting in the middle of what essentially is an internal debate. Jason? No, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't have much more to add to that other than there are some notoriously um, bad people involved in the Taliban. Uh, at some point, the Afghan people are going to have to stand up and fight back uh, uh, these uh, people themselves. Um, if there is a clear and present danger, a threat to the United States of America, then I would hope that through a counterterrorism efforts, we would take out that threat. 
And by the way, you know, Jason, you've done a lot of work on the corruption in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and this is something that we also have to understand that really yeah. makes it very tough for our military. When I went on a, a, a trip there to Afghanistan, I asked uh, General Petraeus, what's the biggest threat to your success? And he said corruption. And he was talking at the high levels of the Karzai administration, where there was evidence of billions of dollars being siphoned off. And then I went down to Kandahar, and I met one of the special forces uh, uh, captains. And I asked him, what's the biggest threat to your success? And he said corruption. And he gave me the example of an Afghan uh, army person shaking down a Afghan family at a checkpoint, where this family pulled up, the Afghan officer went up to him, demanded money, the father wouldn't give it, and the Afghan officer went around and smashed every single window in that man's car, humiliating him, scaring him. And then the captain said to me, you know, that makes those folks, the Afghans, think that we're here protecting that cop when we're here working for these people. So the corruption is a real problem, even in, in the Karzai government. Our next question comes from uh, Reg uh, in Bennington. Reg, are you on the line? I am. Go ahead. Give us your question. Uh, my, my question, and I'd like to hear the uh, Republican congressman's uh, response to this, is the political reality of trying to get us out of, of Afghanistan. It seems as though not all the Republicans, but certainly a vast majority of the Republicans in the House and perhaps in the Senate also, seem to be more intent on making Obama look bad and blocking his positions, whatever they might be, uh, it's, it's more towards getting elected than, than really doing what's good for the country. And I think back to, uh, you know, opening China when the reality was only Richard Nixon could do it because if a Democrat president, a Democratic president, had attempted to go in, uh, the Republicans would have vilified him. And I'm afraid that uh, what we're dealing with is not really a military or even a, a sort of nation building, if you wish, issue, uh, I think the majority of the people in the United States, if you ask them, would say bring the guys home, the guys and gals home. But I, I think the political reality is that Obama can't do it because of the Republicans in Congress. Well, I, I hope uh, the growing number of Republicans who have uh, voted in favor of the, uh, the two amendments that were up on the floor recently Give him uh, whatever air cover that he needs if he truly does want to bring um, uh, the troops home. Look, I, 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 uh, I disagree with the president on a, on a number of different things, uh, but I cannot go so far as to say that I think he's playing politics with our troops. I would not take it that far. In its own odd way, he's had a great deal of Republican support for his actions in Afghanistan. I happen to be an outlier in my party on this issue. Um, and so it, it's interesting that you have different coalitions forming, if you will, on, on different sides. I, I will tell you that I think one of the, the things that's a shame about what happens here in Washington, D.C., I just started my second term, uh, so I'm still pretty new here. Um, and uh, what I found is it's always an election season. It's perpetually an election around here. And so we got to get beyond that. Um, otherwise, you know, people will get... Uh, voted down at the at the ballot box, and, and probably rightfully so, if they're always just play, placing a vote that's like a bet on, on what's going to happen in an election. So I, I think, um, I, I think I, and by the way, uh, just to kind of demonstrate that, I think the president has actually done an admirable job in Iraq. I think we're moving in the right direction. We're making good, having good success there. I've been there a couple of times. We're drawing down our troops. The transition that will happen on January 1st will be difficult, but you know, I give kudos to the president on that. So we're going to have to sort out the people who are just opposed to the president always because he's the president. Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's argue out the issues one at a time. And, you know, that your question does go to the heart of a problem that we have uh, here in Washington. Uh, too much time is spent by sometimes Democrats just trying to figure out what's the best uh, position to take to embarrass the Republicans and vice versa. And that's why I'm quite thrilled to be working with uh, Jason on something we agree on and uh, focusing on the policy, because, you know, that's obviously what is so important. We've got, as Jason mentioned, these are real soldiers 
uh, with, who are committing themselves to follow the orders of the commander in chief, and they are entitled to a policy that's worthy of their willingness to sacrifice, and there should be zero tolerance among those of us who serve to be playing politics with something as profoundly important as national security uh, and the safety of, of, of our soldiers. Uh, so thanks for that question, but I really do appreciate uh, Jason's answer, and I hope a lot of my Democratic colleagues <laughs> hear what he said and take that advice to heart. We've got a question from Chris. Uh, Chris, go ahead. I understand you have a son who's in the Army. We're anxious to hear your question and comment. I do. I have a son uh, who's captain in the Army. Um, he's had two tours in Iraq and a short stint in Afghanistan. Um, his first tour in Iraq, uh, he was due to come back in 12 months, and the president extended it um, to 18 months. Um, and he felt that that first tour that he was there, that they did a lot of good. The second tour, mm -hmm. he was in on a um, different kind of team in, in an advisory capacity to the Iraqi army that mm -hmm. wanted no advice from these 11 people who were sent there for a year um, to help them. And um, it was actually just kind of uh, irritating to hear him talk that um, they were working out a couple times a day, helping as much as they could, helping the locals more than they were the Iraqi army. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, problems that they were having in their community, okay? So I think having a friendly U.S. presence there, helping people was great. But my, in uh, Afghanistan was a totally different story uh, for him. It was a short four-month uh, stint, and he'll be going back again in September for another four months. But here's my thing is as, as people are talking about bringing troops home, I am always concerned about the number of people that are left behind, and are they covered? Are they protected? Um, when my son was there, the first time he was there with the battalion. The second time, he was with 11 Americans being guarded by the Iraqi army. Look what's happened in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. You, you have an Afghani soldier kill U.S. soldiers. Um, and, and the other thing is, is that, that U.S. soldiers that are dying are not on page one anymore. Right. The last 11 oh, Americans right. that were killed are on page seven. And what's in, on page one in Vermont? Flooding. And I can totally understand that local um, should be uh, addressed in our Burlington Free Press. But people are thinking that, oh, well, there, n nobody's getting hurt because it's not on page one anymore. Right. Um, right. Whether they're getting tired of hearing about it or not, I have no idea. My thing is with my son there, I'm not tired of hearing about it because I want to know what's going on. And I want right. to know, are they going to be protected as we start bringing home people? It gets to be some point where... You can't say we're going to leave 20,000 there, we're going to leave 10,000 there, we're going to leave 5,000 there, we're going to leave whatever uh, number there and the capacity and still feel that their families are feeling that they're protected by our U.S. government. Well, thank you so much. And what an amazing uh, record of service and accomplishment that your son has and uh, what an amazing mom you are, uh, having to live day in and day out through two tours in Iraq and a tour in Afghanistan and another one coming. Uh, every day wondering uh, how your son is doing. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you, again, have a very good point, and that's why any policy, whether it's an escalation or a withdrawal, has to be managed by the military who are very conscious of trying to minimize what is a very dangerous situation for our soldiers. You know, your son is there. You know he's in harm's way. Uh, and there are many things, including the Afghans, as you mentioned, turning on some of our soldiers. So that has to be, be managed as best as it can. Congress can't do that. Jason and I can't micromanage. We have to really defer to the, uh, the leadership of our military. The job the president has, and I think we in Congress have, is to try to promote a sensible policy. Uh, that is in the interest of the national security of this country. We're fortunate to have uh, brave, patriotic uh, citizens like your son who are willing to then carry out that policy. Uh, but when it comes to how do we manage it uh, to keep the safety of the troops in mind and the safety of the country in mind, we've got to defer to our military folks on how best to do that in the field and make those tough decisions. Jason, do you have Yeah, I, 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 I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your son's service um, and, 
and thank you for your fa- the, the sacrifice that your family makes. There are people all across the country. That's what makes the United States of America the greatest country on the face of the planet is good young people who step up and, and put themselves in a hard, uh, harm's way in difficult situations. Um, so God bless you. Th- thanks for, for his service. Um, it, Peter's absolutely right. Congress should not be micromanaging this war. I just would say briefly, philosophically, I believe, get in and then get out. Uh, the, mil- the American military can do anything. It is the, the most lethal fighting force in the world. But if you're going to go to war, go with everything, everything that you have. Get the job done and then bring them right home. What I think Peter and I are both concerned about is that this is this mission creep, if you will, has set in where now we're there for 10 years and beyond. There's no, there doesn't seem to be any end to this. Um, and so... Yes, we're going to be involved in counterterrorism, but the nation building, that's not what the American military was built to do. Um, And certainly if those metrics for that type of action were applied to other countries, we'd be in countries (laughs) on most every continent. So um, anyway, that's that's the concern. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Remember, anybody on the call, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, hit star three, and uh, you'll be live on, on the call with us. Uh, our next question comes from John in Bennington. John, you're on the air. Yeah, I have a question. Are we going to end up like we did in Vietnam, where we ended up having millions of troops go over there and half a million die because of uh, politics? Or are we going to end up with another uh, place where we have to rebuild like we did Germany? Are we going to end up with them? We, we, we hope not. I mean, that is the fear. This, we are, the longest war in the history of the United States. We're spending about $2 billion a week in Afghanistan. Um, it's just I, we don't see an end to it, and that's why we think the policy needs to change. And, you know, the other thing is that there's been real success here. Keep in mind there was a legitimate reason to go into Afghanistan. Uh, the, the, the Taliban provided a safe haven uh, for Osama bin Laden. Uh, Al-Qaeda had training camps. And when we demanded, uh, President Bush demanded that the Taliban turn over Osama bin Laden, they wouldn't do it. And the original reason to go in there had merit. Uh, but what did happen after we went in and drove Al-Qaeda out is the mission creep that Jason mentioned. We suddenly took on the responsibility of building this feudal society into a modern nation state. And frankly, we can, it's not really doable. Now, fast forward, one of the major objectives we had in going into Afghanistan in the first place was to get Osama bin Laden. And the good news is we got him. He's been brought to justice. So it does allow us to step back so that we don't have a Vietnam situation. Uh, anyone who wants to call, uh, he spoke, yeah, uh, hit star three and we'll get you on the call. Uh, we've got a call from uh, Kelly in Salisbury. Uh, Kelly, you're on the air. Hi. My question is, is there any kind of education in your pa- in your package that you're presenting that would um, basically not let the, the Afghan people go back to their second grade level education, but allow them to not want to pursue terrorism based on the education package that we have? Okay. I'll let, uh, I'll let Jason answer this. He's going to have to... Uh, leave us after this call, so you get the you get the last question to him in. But I'll be staying on the call. Well, first of all, thanks. Thank you for the call. These, these are this is uh, is enjoyable. This is fun, and I I appreciate it. It's what we should be talking about. Um, the bills that we had talked about really dealt with the military component. There is also a USAID component, which is uh, where our U.S. aid and development comes from. I have some serious questions for USAID. I think they have. Uh, We've lacked results in terms of demonstrating metrics as to what's been built, uh, the dollars that have been spent, and the the benefit uh, that has been gained uh, through their efforts. But there are quite a, a significant amount of U.S. dollars going to the educational component, uh, particularly for women in education. Um, there have been a lot of things going into water and electrical development, particularly in, in Afghanistan where you have nearly 80% of the country with no electricity. So the bill that we've dealt with, at least so far, dealt with the military component, but there is the aid package. Uh, our subcommittee actually is helping to oversee that. There will be some future hearings dealing with this. 
because I don't think that uh, USAID is doing a good enough job informing Congress, let alone the American people, what all their dollars, and they are billions of dollars, are being used to, and what kind of results are they gaining? Well, I, uh, Jason, maybe just want to say goodbye to Vermont. Yes, look, it's it, nice to have you. Thank you. If you, you want to, I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, look, there are some people in Congress you'd really rather not deal with, but I can tell you, as a conservative Republican from Utah, uh, interacting with Peter Welch, uh, he's he's a good good man. I disagree with him on a lot of issues. This is one that we agree on. And uh, but I always uh, I appreciate. It. I think we'll see a, a growing uh, friendship and. Uh, relationship and working together. Like I said, we'll disagree on some things, but where we agree, we'll, we'll come together. And so I appreciate you having me on the call tonight, Peter. Thank well, you. Well, we want to get you up to uh, we want to get you up to Vermont, and you know, to say thank you on behalf of all the people of Vermont, I'm going to give you a pint of maple syrup. Hey, on the way out the door. Okay. It, it, it won't last long. So thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Appreciate it. <laughs> See you later. See you later. Um, uh, I want to thank Jason Chaffetz. Uh, you know, I, one of the things that I have been hearing from Vermonters is they want us to work together if we can, uh, because they know uh, rightly that the only way we're going to solve problems is by working together. Working together doesn't mean you give up your principles. It means you find common ground. And where you have common ground, you try to make substantive progress rather than make political points. And uh, Jason's been great to work with that way. Uh, remember, anybody on the call who wants to participate, hit star three, and you'll be uh, put on the air to ask a question or make a comment. We've got Joanne from Bennington. Uh, Joanne, uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for letting me get on the air. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, this isn't political. What it is is more economics. And I'm wondering, I'm sure people have looked at this, but considering how much we're spending, as you guys say, on a weekly basis, is this something that if you were, if you had a business that you would not be studying the exit strategy. In other words, we yes, we caused some damage, and now we're rebuilding. But isn't there a way of looking at you know how much damage we caused as opposed to how much we're reinvesting in those countries? And can't we just say you know we've already invested so many times more whatever damage we caused, we don't have to apologize for getting out? Well, we, we don't have to apologize. I mean, it, 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 this is not about, quote, getting out so much as, as it is about uh, asking a question about whether nation building is a smart and sustainable financially and militarily way to go to protect our national security. So, you know, the heart of our argument, Jason and I, is that nation building just doesn't make sense from a national security standpoint and certainly from a fiscal standpoint especially when you're trying to do the nation building with a partner, the Karzai government, which is clearly corrupt. You know, uh, they just cannot control uh, the, 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 the grand larceny that goes on every day uh, from American taxpayers. So uh, we've, we've made a major commitment there with our soldiers uh, and with our taxpayer dollars going into so-called redevelopment projects. Uh, you know, just as an example, when I was preparing for this, I saw that we spent last year in one province in uh, Afghanistan, uh, Helmand province, where there's 80,000 people. Okay, that's, uh, you know, there, there's more people in Chittenden County. Uh, we spent $1.3 billion, and I'm not sure what we have to show for it, but everybody knows we could use that money back home. So thank you for your, your question, Joanne. Um, our next, again, hit star three if you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question. Uh, we've got Sue from Wilmington. Uh, go ahead, Sue. Hi. I, I appreciate being able to uh, participate. This was great. Um, I totally agree with what both of you have said about Afghanistan and really feel strongly we should, should be out. Um, what I'm not so convinced about uh, is what we've done in Libya and what our position should be. You know, I, I, I see the distinction you're talking about between involving ourselves in nation building, and I'm assuming you kind of, you see Libya in that light. I, I just wonder, is there anything to be gained by our involvement in this sort of wave of reform that's happening in that area of the world? And 
um, sort of positioning ourselves in favor of um, the reform movement there. Um, so I, well, I, think, I just wanted uh, to get more information from yeah. you. Well, very, very good question. And I, I think there's two, there's two parts to it, really. Uh, I think very much we should be supportive of the democratic stirrings that we're seeing uh, throughout the Middle East. Uh, you know, what's interesting is all of these citizen uh, demonstrations uh, seem to be totally homegrown. Uh, uh, many of them started with the people in these oppressed countries like Syria, Libya, Tunisia, Yemen, uh, getting stirrings of wanting to control their own future. And that's a good thing. And to the extent that we can be supportive of those democratic aspirations, I believe that uh, we should be. The Libya situation is is uh, is its own separate question. It's not at all like Afghanistan. I mean, essentially, what you have there is a megalomaniac, demented, uh, crazy ruler uh, who's a threat to his people. Who actually said that he was going to hunt down people and, and pursue them in their closets like they're rats. I mean, this is unbelievable. And the question for really the world community, with NATO involved, is whether. Uh, it would be appropriate and effective to take some action on a temporary basis to avert a humanitarian disaster. And the president supported that. NATO has supported it. Uh, it's clear that uh, Gaddafi is hanging on by his fingernails. Uh, but it does raise these questions about how long. And right now you have a multilateral involvement with NATO uh, that's led by NATO with the U.S. providing some resources. Uh, my view is that it's been there 60 days, and it would be better for the president uh, to uh, to seek more consultation and permission from Congress. But uh, he's made it very, very clear, uh, and I support him in this, that we're not going to put soldiers on the ground. We're not going to have boots on the ground. Uh, so that's an evolving situation there, but it is, as you point out, considerably different from uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. Hit star three if you would like to uh, make a comment or you'd like to participate uh, in the call by asking a question. Uh, Leo, you're on. You're from Minuski, I understand. Go ahead. Good evening, uh, Mr. Welch. I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you. And uh, first of all, I want to explain that uh, uh, I was very happy to hear uh, you get involved in what you're doing now and, uh, and working against... Uh, uh, I, I, I believe a, a lot of foolishness that uh, uh, a lot of people in Washington there have uh, about Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, all of these other uh, countries. Um, first of all, uh, I don't think that they remember or remember their history that way back in probably in the 1800s or even earlier before that, the British tried to uh, conquer the Arab Arabic nations in those areas, and they 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 wound up getting their well, I, I can't say the word, but anyway, they get they they wound up losing, and they had to pull out. And one one of the uh, more earlier earlier history or, or later history, I should say, um, now uh, uh, that's happened during our lifetime is that the Russians were in there, and with all of the huge power that they had. And the the uh, the type of equipment that they had, uh, they they could not uh, even make a dent in uh, the Arabic uh, uh, people that they were fighting, and uh, I I don't understand why we or our uh, representatives in Washington ever got the idea that we could go in there and do something that uh, other very powerful countries could not do. Uh, if you take it, it's almost like. Uh, uh, way way back in our early history here in the United States, and uh, trying to get separated from uh, uh, the British, uh, the, uh, what we're doing is the same thing that the, the our so our uh, uh, the British soldiers were were, uh, were accustomed to just standing out there in a line and uh, uh, firing uh, on on command, and yet the uh, the American. Uh, 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 well, uh, 
hunters and so on and so forth. They were just hiding behind rocks and bushes and whatever and shooting at the at the. Uh, well, Leo, uh, let me let me take a stab at uh, just uh, commenting. I you know you make yeah. you make a lot of sense. I mean that you, what we've got is this strategy uh, that is of questionable merit. You've got Al Qaeda dispersed and decentralized all around the world. Uh, and we have decided to put 100,000 troops and 100,000 contractors in one country, even though the terrorist threat is in many different countries. And obviously, if you're spending money in one place, you know, a couple of billion dollars a week uh, supporting that, that army, that takes away resources from the uh, intelligence gathering uh, efforts that are so essential uh, to successful uh, 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 squashing of terrorist threats. So, you know, I think that uh, Jason and I are asking a question in our amendments uh, that many Americans are asking, that I run into Vermonters like you every day, and they just wonder whether this makes sense to be trying to do uh, in Afghanistan, build a modern uh, nation state uh, when so many before us have failed in that effort and when it seems to be so attenuated from actually protecting us from a terrorist threat. So thank you. Anyone else uh, on the call who wants to make a comment or uh, ask a question, hit star three and you will be connected to the call. We've got Donald from Fairfax. Donald, how are you doing? Go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm echoing everybody's uh, uh, philosophy is, is that we, we, owe so, we owe so much, uh, we have to borrow money from the Chinese and, and so forth. I, I can't, uh, I can't understand why we're sticking our noses in other people's uh, uh, business. So, uh, I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it is if if this is if it was a real business, and we borrowed from a bank and and uh, you know gave it to uh, a town or something, right. we, we wouldn't be in business very long. Well, you're exactly so, right. Uh, no, you're exa- you're exactly right, and one of the one of the challenges we have is linking the obligation we have to pay for something with the support for the doing of it. And you know, this is the first time in our history with the Iraq War and the in the uh, uh, Afghanistan War, where the entire cost of the war was simply put on the credit card. You know, we're going to have a big debate here about. Uh, whether we do or don't, raise the debt ceiling. Nobody wants to do it, but one of the reasons we have to is we've got to pay bills that we've incurred. So a lot of folks have voted for every uh, every time we got to Iraq, they voted to spend the money. Every time we got on Afghanistan, last week the defense appropriations bill or authorization bill set aside $106 billion for Afghanistan. And a lot of members of Congress just voted for it, spend the money. Well, then today we're going to be de- we're debating whether to raise the debt ceiling, which is absolutely required if we're actually going to pay the bill rather than just stiff our creditors since we're borrowing the money. So, you know, it's the only time in history where we've lowered taxes during a time of war rather than raise taxes in order to pay for it. And that refusal to accept responsibility for decisions, fiscal responsibility, creates this illusion that it's a cost-free situation, uh, and it's not. It's not cost-free at all uh, for those families whose sons and daughters are serving, uh, for those soldiers uh, and those families that have lost their lives, uh, and it's not cost-free for the taxpayers. So, you know, you're right on this. Um, hit star three if you would like to make a comment or you'd like to ask a question. Uh, we've got Michael from Underhill. Michael, go ahead. Hi, Peter. Uh, I've been enjoying listening to the questions and all. I, I have. Uh, I, I'm a vet, and uh, two of my children are um, in the military. My oldest son is a master sergeant, and my daughter is a sergeant. She just wow. came back from her last overseas tour about a year ago, and she's a troubled individual. And um, I, at this point, I'm not really worried about. Um, what we can do for these other countries. I'm really starting to become very concerned about the future uh, of these soldiers 
that have spent time over there. Um, you know, what what is our country going to look like in the near future? Um, I really think that we're going to be dealing with, with a lot of troubled individuals. Um, and I guess to see whether whether it was really worth it, I guess uh, history uh, is going to tell us. But um, uh, like you were saying, uh, if we're going to stay there, it could be 50 years. Peter, I think it'd be longer than that because um, you have to change the way these people think. Um, and right, that's right. I, it's it's, that's order. a very difficult situation, and I, and I don't know if uh, you know, Michael. Uh, go ahead. Wait, I was. I, well, I no, don't mean ahead, to interrupt, Peter. but I just, you know, you you are bringing up one of the most uh, painful, poignant, and powerful uh, responsibilities that we have. I mean, you're a dad. You've had two kids who uh, served their country, and you've described, you know, one of your kids coming home. Uh, bearing the scars of war. And I know that I speak for Senator Leahy and I speak for Senator Sanders when I say that the entire Vermont Congre congressional delegation uh, is absolutely determined that the cost of this war does have to include the cost of caring for these warriors. So we have got a responsibility, whether we were supportive of the war in Iraq or Afghanistan or we opposed it, we got to support the troops, and when that means supporting them uh, when they get home. And uh, it's hard uh, for, for, for our, our young folks coming home from serving in the military, and if they need help, we've got to be there to make sure that they get it. So, so thank you. Uh, no one could speak more powerfully about this than a, a father like you did, so thank you. Uh, anyone, who else, anyone who wants to ask a question or make a comment, uh, hit star three, and you'll be connected live uh, to the call. Our next question comes from Nora in Montpelier. Uh, Nora, go ahead. I don't know if Nora's there, but Nora asked a question uh, about what does oil have to do with the war? Uh, you know, in Afghanistan, I don't think that the oil is the big issue. Uh, the oil, I think, was a significant issue in Iraq. Uh, you know, the Middle East, uh, in our dependence on it, the Middle East is a source of major uh, oil for us, and we're dependent on getting it to keep the economy going. And uh, I think everybody who's candid acknowledges that a major reason we get involved in some of these things is uh, the, the, the concern about keeping the oil lanes open. And it really raises the obvious question, why don't we get off our addiction to imported oil? It makes no sense, and it makes us vulnerable and draws us into conflicts that don't, uh, don't serve us well. So I think our energy policy is dramatically in need of reform. We should be working very hard for energy independence. Why? It'll make us politically stronger, number one. Number two, it'll make us economically stronger. I mean, every dollar that we spend on energy at home, you know, developing alternative renewable fuels, uh, is a job we create here uh, in Vermont, so in, in, in America. So, you know, we've got to do that. Uh, we've got one last call. We're about uh, at the end of our call, and we've got Dale from Barry. Dale, go ahead. And how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm doing good. Okay. Um, first of all, the Afghan-Iraq situation is not the first time we've put anything on the credit card. Vietnam was put on the credit card. Um, Partly. He, huh? Partly. This is the first time we've cut taxes in a time of war, literally. Well, yeah, that's true. But it was put on the credit card because we run budget deficits that whole time. Yeah. Um, and, and even the uh, Desert Storm was put on the credit card. But that's beside the point. Um all we're really doing is following the Bush doctrine with no new ideas popping up from the Obama administration. Well, you know, I'm going to – you're making a provocative but I think accurate statement there. You know, uh, uh, the the president, of course, ran on bringing our troops home from Iraq, and he is doing that. And then on Afghanistan, when he did his policy review, he decided to, uh, to send 30,000 additional troops. Now, my view is the president uh, – I think it's a skeptic of nation building, 
in my view, is that this vote we had on Mr. Chaffetz's amendment and mine and Mr. McGovern's, that is going to be real support to encourage the president to accelerate the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I think that what the president can rightly conclude from this vote is that if he accelerates that withdrawal, then Congress is going to have his back. And that includes some conservative Republicans like Jason Chaffetz. So this vote is very significant. You know, at the end of the day, it's the commander in chief who's going to make the final decision that really matters. But when he knows that he's got political support in Congress from both parties, it's going to make it much easier for him, uh, we believe, to make that decision to move away from uh, nation building, expensive, unsustainable towards counterterrorism uh, that we saw work quite effectively in bringing Osama bin Laden to justice. So I want to thank you uh, all for being uh, on the call tonight. Uh, this was uh, uh, is a great opportunity for uh, Jason Chaffetz. As I mentioned, uh, he self-described very conservative Republican from, uh, from Utah, and uh, I've been around him and seeing how he votes, and I can confirm that he's not kidding. This guy's conservative. But he's, uh, he's, he's, he's been, uh, uh, you know, he's principal conservative, and he and I agree on the need to move away from nation building and start bringing our troops home from Afghanistan. And we also agree that when uh, we find common ground, it's most, much more important that, that we work together than, uh, than, and, and solve a problem rather than try to score political points. Uh, I thank everybody who participated in the call, uh, uh, everyone who uh, if anyone called and wanted to get on the call and we weren't able to get to you, we, uh, we regret that. We're sorry, but we did our best. And uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Vermonters uh, for being so active and so involved. Let's keep in mind uh, that Vermonters have sacrificed virtually more than any other state in the nation. You know, we have uh, National Guard uh, members, 1,500 strong, who were deployed to Afghanistan. We've got other uh, Vermonters who served in uh, uh, the, all of the military services. They sacrificed. They stepped up to defend this country. Uh, they're coming home, thank goodness. But we did lose uh, more Vermonters on a per capita basis than any other state in the nation. And it is part of our history. The Civil War, it was Vermonters who lost more of its citizens on a per capita basis than any other northern state. Uh, so Vermonters serve, and our job in Congress and the president's job is to provide them with a policy that's worthy of the sacrifice that they're so willing to make on our behalf. So I want to thank the men and women of the military from Vermont who served us so well. I want to thank Vermonters for participating in this, and I want to uh, bid all of you a good night. Thank you very much.